Oh, there you are. Good morning, hello, and welcome to this week's Libraries Adventures Live. My name's Olma and I work for Kirklees Libraries, and I'm here today to share with you a fabulous Library Adventures Live session, a story reading and a draw along. So make sure that you have at the ready for later on a pencil and a nice piece of paper. Now, for those of you on holiday from school or nursery, don't forget you can watch all our Library Adventures Live videos if you've missed any of them or if you'd like to watch some of them again. We'll pop the website address on the screen for you to follow the links. There it is. So back to today, we're really lucky to have with us not one, but two artists. We've got Helen and Tom Doherty, creators of The Snatcher Book, and they're coming along to introduce their fantastic new picture book, the Screen Thief, which features a fabulous character called the Snaffle. Helen, the author, will be reading her story while Tom shares his wonderful illustrations. And afterwards, Tom will lead a drawer along. And I'm quietly hoping that we'll be drawing the Snaffle, but we'll have to wait and find out. Now, if you have any questions or comments, please pop them in the chat. And Helen and Tom will have some time at the end of the session to answer them. Just back quickly to the Snatcher book that I mentioned. It's being republished next month and it's going to have a brand new cover. It's a delightful bedtime story and it's also a prize winner, a prize winner chosen by children, not by grown-ups. So definitely one to watch for. Now, I think that's enough for me for now. So let's meet Helen and Tom, the author and the illustrator of today's featured book, The Screen Thief. Hi Helen, hi Tom, lovely hi, to see Alma. you. Hi, hi Alma. <laughs> you too. Oh, thank you so much for inviting us on. We're really excited to be here today and to be part of Libraries Adventures Live. So hello to everybody out there from hi Swansea. There. We live in Swansea in South Wales and even though we're in different rooms right now, we are actually married to each other and we are in the same house, just in different rooms, in case you were wondering. And uh, I'm actually in the studio where Helen and I do our work and where I create all the pictures for, for our books. If I just move the camera around, you can see there's my desk. It's, it's full of little bottles of ink and paintbrushes and pencils. And there's a little pile, you get a sneak preview of a little pile of artwork that uh, I'm preparing for our, uh, a new book that we're doing together. So that's where that's we nice. are. And, um, and I'm in the other room and you can see behind me here, I've got a few different copies of The Screen Thief. And that's the book I'm going to share with you now. Uh, so this is the story of a little creature called the Snaffle. You can see her here looking rather surprised because she's arrived in a new city um, looking for friends, looking for somebody to play with. But the problem is that nobody seems to notice her. Everybody seems to be far too busy staring at well what you're staring at right now staring at a screen you can see one here in the picture going beep so are you ready for the story tom is going to share the illustrations while i read the story to you let me just find them on my computer here they are can you see that there's the cover up i can't see it yet I think Alma might need to. There we are. There we go. That's it. With a screen so thief. This is the screen thief. And I wrote the story and Tom did I the drew wonderful illustration. All the pictures. So this is the story of the screen thief. <laughs> the snaffle arrived in the city one day. She wanted to make some new friends and to play. But nobody realised the snaffle was there. The people she saw seemed too busy to care. Everyone seems to be glued to a screen. The snaffle was puzzled. What could these screens mean? What was so special? What did they hide? Perhaps they had some kind of magic inside. The snaffle felt lonely all on her own. Then she heard something beeping, somebody's phone. She sniffed it. She bit it. She chewed it once, twice. For something so shiny, it tasted quite nice. The snaffle looked round her. What else could she eat? Some screens were salty and some screens were sweet. There were screens you could nibble and screens you could munch. 
chewy screens, gooey screens, screens that went crunch. The snaffle ate more and her appetite grew. The tiniest phone screens would no longer do. She polished off 20 computers with ease and gobbled up 59 widescreen TVs. Cinemas started to turn folk away. Tonight's film is cancelled, we're sorry to say. We don't know what's happened. It's ever so weird. The seats are all there, but the screens disappeared. Adverts were swiped from the city's main square. People were left staring into thin air. Yet one child called Max wasn't nearly so sad. He didn't think life without screens was that bad. But nobody else was prepared to forgive. Without all our screens, how on earth can we live? A small, anxious crowd was beginning to grow. Who could have done this? Does anyone know? I think that I saw her. She's small and she's blue. She's sneaky and dangerous. I saw her too. The snaffle sat down. She needed a break. Her belly was full. It was starting to ache. Despite all the various screens she had tried, the snaffle still felt kind of empty inside. Then she saw something different. It somehow looked right. A child playing happily. No screen in sight. She thought, he looks friendly. And Max thought the same. Two seconds later, she joined in his game. Max and the snaffle were laughing so loud, neither one noticed a large, angry crowd. Look, there's the monster that stole all our screens. We can't let her near any other machines. Stop her, quick, catch her. No, chase her away. Please don't, Max protested. She just wants to play. Why don't you all join us? It's really good fun. Everyone stared, then joined in one by one. Things changed in the city that same afternoon. Screens were forgotten surprisingly soon. Folks chatted to neighbours, they played with their friends and discovered new ways to fill up their weekends. And as for the snaffle, she's never looked back. Though sometimes she snaffles a screen for a snack. And that was the story of the screen thief. I hope you all enjoyed it, everybody. Um, as you can see, the, the, the snaffle, when she arrives in the city, she's standing here on this very first page. I'll show you the illustration again. The first page, here she is looking out over the city. And I don't know whether you, anybody noticed who was in the window just beneath her. Can you see? It was Max. He was actually there all along, but she didn't find him until later in the story. And if you look at this page, you'll see that the, the square in the city is really quite empty. And if you look really closely, you'll see that everybody, all the characters in the scene are staring at a screen. I don't know whether you can see there, even the people on the train, even the train driver, everybody in fact, except for Max and the snaffle. And if you look at the very last page of the story, it's exactly the same scene, but of course, it's completely transformed. It's completely different because now the whole square, the whole city square is filled with people chatting, dancing, playing music um, on their skateboards, on their scooters, all having fun together. Nobody is looking at a screen. In fact, it's only the snaffle now who's enjoying a screen for a snack. And you can see Max in the window beneath her. There he is again. And now they're friends. And I, I had so much fun. I had so much fun creating the whole city and Absolutely. filling it with people and life 
and all the different shops and buildings. Maybe, maybe we'll talk a bit more about that later. Yeah. And as you can see, the snaffle helps to bring everybody in the city together. Forget about their screens for the moment and go outside, have fun together. And yeah, just enjoy being together and playing. So, Tommy, you're going to show us how you drew yes, the snaffle. I am. So if, if you've got a bit of paper and a pen or a pencil, it doesn't really matter what colour it is. Um, I'm going to show you very quickly how to draw your very own snaffle. So I've got a big flip chart here. Um, when I'm when I'm creating a character or, or I'm drawing live, I like to try and think of everything with quite simple shapes. And the snaffle, uh, you could think of. Let's let's start. I often start with the face and the eyes. So we're going to start with the eyes. We draw two circles. Two circles for the eyes, and I'm going to put some pupils in for dots, and they're going to be looking down. Now the snaffle has got um, a long trunk, and uh, in fact, I'm going to be drawing the snaffle eating something. So if you've got a long trunk, you should have to sort of get it out of the way so she can eat. So I'm going to have the trunk. I'm going to start underneath the eye, and I'm going to curve it up and around. So that's going to be the top of the trunk. And the bottom of the trunk is going to start below the eyes here. And I'm going to move it. And it gets a little bit thinner as it goes towards the end. And on the end, you've got the end of, a, I suppose, her, her nose, really. It's like the end of a balloon, but it's been tied up. So that's the start of the snaffle. Now, the snaffle has got um, long, sort of rabbity ears. And they're very expressive. They can, they can poke up when she's really excited. And they can flop over when she's feeling a bit sad. So I'm going to have mine sort of flopping backwards a bit. There's one there just above one eye. And one there above the other one. And you can have one slightly behind the other. Now the snaffle's got, I'm going to put little eyelashes in, just some lines. And then I'm going to start drawing her mouth. So the bottom of the trunk, we're going to have a big open mouth like this because she's just about to chomp into a screen. Now the screen I'm going to draw, I'm going to start by drawing sort of oblong shape like that. And because she's biting it, I'm going to have her taking a big chunk out of it. And we could finish off the rest of her mouth there. Now she's got quite a round head. So we could we could do that next. We could put the, the head in here. And we also, she's going to be holding the screen like, like it's a big bar of chocolate or something. She's going to have some arms coming off the side like this. And you can have arms coming off the side here. And she's got little claws or paws which can hold the screen. I've just done three little curvy lines. You can even put a tongue in if you want her, um, like she's just about to gobble it up. And she's got quite a short body. And it's a bit fluffy at the bottom. So you can give her a fluffy... And then the legs, Maybe I have to move this back just a little bit. And she's got, the legs are quite thin. So they start thick and they get thin at the bottom. And again, she's got little paws or claws on the bottom as well. So that, that's the staffle eating a screen. And because she's eating the screen, we could also have lots of, you put little triangles, of screen falling off and landing on the floor. So she's really munching it. And when I created the snaffle, we decided um, that we wanted her to be, you know, a slightly different color from the other animals in the book. And uh, we looked at all the different animals and realized that, that no one was sort of blue. So I found a special blue ink. I think it's turquoise it's called, but uh, I stuck a little label on it, I called it Staffle Blue, and I used it only to paint 
the snaffle. I've got a bigger pot of it here and uh, very quickly, you don't have to do this, or maybe you could do this later if you haven't got any blue on you, but uh, I'm gonna just get a brush. It's rather nice and I'm going to start colouring in my snaffle very, very quickly with this beautiful snaffle blue colour. The other thing that we um, we did when we made the book was um, we wanted, because we wanted the snaffle to stand out as a character, we, um, because she's got a trunk, we decided we didn't want her to get confused with any of the other animals. So it, you, if you look very carefully through the book, you'll notice that there are, there are no elephants because we didn't want any, any other animals with trunks. There's a uh, rhinoceroses and there's hippos, but there's no elephants. The other thing that we also didn't want to confuse her with is because she's got rabbit ears, we didn't want to confuse her with any rabbits. So uh, you'll notice there aren't any rabbits. There are lots of other small animals, but no rabbits. So I'm just going to finish really quickly putting in the last bit of colour on the snaffle. We also, maybe I'll show you later, we went through lots and lots of different ideas because when you're designing a book, it's not usually your first idea that you go with. So um, I drew lots and lots of different types of snaffle and some of them were very, very different from how the snaffle looks now. We had a long conversation with um, the art director on the project and with Helen about exactly what the snaffle should look like. Of course, she had to be small. I wanted to look kind of, you know, really cute, you know, because they say that she's a monster, but actually she's not a monster at all, really, is she? She's, uh, she's actually just lonely and she wants to play. So there we go, I just coloured the snaffle in really quickly. And you could write her name as well. You could write the snaffle. And there we go, there is our snaffle art. I'd love to see later on if you're able to post them or anything, some of your own pictures that you did of the snaffle. And snaff the snaffle makes a really good friend in the book and uh, the friend she makes is called Max. And I thought that if you can just grab another bit of paper, we could also see how to draw Max. And as usual, I smudge myself. I get, I love working with, uh, with all the inks and the, the paint. Uh, I like the, the way you can get messy. I do work with the, the computer as well sometimes. So I just moved the snaffle out the way and, um, and we'll do Max next. Now Max, I don't know, can anyone remember what sort of animal Max is? Well, Max is a little lion. And uh, we start with Max by, again, I'm gonna start with his eyes. And uh, I don't know if you remember, Max is actually wearing glasses. He's got these red glasses. And they're round. So I'm going to start with two red circles. Just like that. Hang on, that's all right. Uh, the pupils in and because Max is a lion he's going to have a triangular nose and a little smile so already you can see his face is really starting to to take shape he's got sort of ears which are wider at the top and thinner at the bottom but quite square and he's got lovely curly and fluffy around the edges bits of fur so that'll be Max's face now Max when he meets the snaffle he's playing a game in fact he's playing football and I've got him like holding the football in, in one arm but you know when I'm actually drawing the characters I'm often sort of I have to draw them in so many different positions that I often sort of try to act out how they'll be standing to try and sort of work out. So we've got one arm coming around the side like this. And what you could do is once you've drawn that, you could then draw 
the football in, which would just be a big circle, and the other and the arm coming over and pause, which is just three little circles there. And then the other arm, maybe Max got it like on his hip like this. So he's standing like this. And uh, he's got quite a short body. Again, you could put in the three circles of the paws. He's got quite a short body like this and one leg coming down here again quite short a bit wider at the top getting a bit smaller and you can put again three ovals or paws and the other leg here leave a little gap between the legs and then the other leg again slightly wider at the top and the paws at the bottom and then there's one thing missing from Max. Well, should we put some, we can put some details on the football to make it look more like a football. Just some curved lines like that. Now, because Max is a lion, it'd be really nice to add in a short but curvy tail. And on the end, because he's a little lion, I just do a, a sort of black scribble or a tassel on the end. I sometimes like putting a sort of shadow underneath as well to make them sort of sit on the ground. I've got another bottle of ink here. If I grab another brush. And um, this one is a sort of yellow colour because Max is sort of yellow, sort of lion yellow. And I could very quickly just. I think I've got a little bit of blue left on my brush, so maybe he's going to go a little bit green. And Max also, he wasn't going to be, it was only later that we decided to make him a lion. To begin with, he was going to be a fox. Uh, and you'll notice in the book there are lots of different foxes. And uh, I don't know if we ever thought he'd be a tiger. Usually I'd leave the paws white. Actually, I'd usually leave a little bit of white on his um, on his face as well, around his nose. A bit of white on his on his tummy, and leave his paws white as well. And there we go. That is a very, very quick sketch of Max. So that's Max and the Snaffle. And the next time you're drawing a character, it'd be great, you know, I think trying to think of your characters in as a mixture of simple shapes, circles for the eyes, you could think of a sort of oval for the head, another oval for the body, sticks, Oblongs for the legs and just use the simple shapes to, to stick them all together to create your characters. That was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much, Tom. <laughs> about draw a house. So. <laughs> well, we hope everybody had fun drawing along with Tom. And um, if you find that you know you ran out of time or you couldn't quite do it fast enough, you can always go back and watch it afterwards, can't they, Alma? Also, you can have as many goes as you like. And on my um, on my website, and I think on Helen's website as well, there's mm -hmm. a, there's an activities page, and uh, there's all sorts of activities on my website, which you can see there, including a step by step guide of how to draw the snaffle. So, if you if you want to see uh, a series of pictures of how you build up the snaffle in simple shapes, then go to my activities website. And and the, like I said, there's loads of other activities and how to draw um, yeah. sections on there too. And the great thing about that is that you can pause it as well, can't you? You can, yes. It's just a PDF, so you can even download it and print it off, and then you yeah. can follow it slowly, step by step. That's right. That's brilliant. And, then, so and if there are any teachers out there, just wanted to mention quickly that um, on my website, on the Snaffle page, 
uh, or the Screen Thief page of my website, uh, there are some fantastic resources which our publisher, Scholastic, has produced. Um, and they are for anybody at home or for teachers as well um, to download for free. So there's an activity pack to accompany the book. And there are also some lesson plans as well to accompany the Screen Thief. So they're all for free. You can find them on the Screen Thief page of my website and also on the resources page. So yeah, do go and have a look. And um, we hope you'll enjoy doing some of that, those activities as a follow up at home. That sounds amazing. Are we ready for some questions? Absolutely. Oh, right. So we've, we have some questions that people have sent in to us. Okay. And I think Nicola's going to bring them up on the screen. So the first one, what was the inspiration for the snaffle? Well, that's definitely a question for Helen, because yeah. um, when you're doing a picture book that you always or the publishers always want to see the story first and then the pictures come second. So the, the snaffle really was um, a, cr a creation of Helen's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so the snaffle. Um... First thing to say that she wasn't always called the Snaffle. That name came at quite a later stage. Uh, so I was sort of trying to think of new ideas. And one thing that I've been struck by for a long time um, was how increasingly we're becoming more and more um, focused on technology as a society. And that's, that's quite normal. And it's also very good as well, because, for example, without screens, how could we communicate with people that don't live near us? So that they're, they're a fantastic way to communicate with grandparents or relatives or friends that may be living in another part of the country or even in another country. So there's, there's all many, so many really positive things about screens. But I think what I have noticed over the years is more and more people looking at their screens when they're out and about. And sometimes like even on, on a bus, for example, or a train, everyone's just looking at their screens. They don't seem to be talking to each other so much anymore. And um, so that was something at the back of my mind. And then one day I had this idea, what would happen if you had a creature that actually consumed technology? So in the way that we are always looking at our screens, what if there was a creature that actually decided to eat um, a piece of technology <laughs> and what would happen? And what would happen if they got a taste for it and then they carried on eating and they just ate and ate until they devoured, literally eaten up, gobbled up every single piece of technology in the whole city, every single screen. And I thought that would be quite a fun idea, quite original and different, quite a fun way of showing, I suppose, um, maybe showing what happens to us when we consume too much technology in a way. Um, but when I first had this idea, I imagined the creature to be um, maybe possibly even something out of this world, something that was perhaps even made from discarded old bits of technology itself. Um, and then when I thought about it a bit longer, I thought, no, it'd be actually much, much better if we kept it simple and just had a little creature that came from somewhere else, arrived in a city and I was thinking, well, what does she really want? Does she really want these screens? No, what she really wants is a friend. She's looking for someone to play with. She just wants to have fun. Um, and then the problem is that nobody takes any notice of her. And so a little bit like, um, I don't know whether you've ever seen um, a toddler who's trying to get their parents' attention, but maybe the mum or dad are, are looking at their phone and, and the kid starts playing up a bit. Um, I know that we've all been guilty of doing that. We've got kids as well. We've all been guilty of doing that. And then the kids start mucking around. And I thought, well, maybe it'd be quite fun to have the snaffles a bit like a little creature like that that gets naughty because nobody's taking any attention, get paying her any attention. And so she starts to eat these screens quite literally. Um, and as for the name, um, I remember tried, I knew it was going to have to be two syllables to fit with the rhyme scheme. The first name I thought of was the Ludix, which is sort of from like Ludo, the word to play. I wanted to have a name that was original and different and didn't come up anywhere else, but that didn't seem quite right. And then I can't remember how I thought the snaffle, it just came came to me one day and I thought, yeah, that's actually quite nice because it's, it's an actual word that's part of our language. Just snaffle means to um, take something that's not, that's not yours or in a slightly greedy way, like you might snaffle some biscuits when nobody's looking, but it's not like a really evil word either. It doesn't suggest a really evil creature. It's just, um, someone who's 
taking the opportunity to grab something. Um, I think it's a fun word. Turned. It's quite it fun, isn't fun. it? It's playful. Yeah, it is. It's a playful word. It sounds very harmless. And it just seemed perfect to describe this creature, this character that I'd invented. Um, as Tom said, we didn't know what she was going to look like. And I didn't well, know what she was going to look share, like. I'm going to share my screen now and show them. Um, yeah. Show everybody a, a selection of the different. Can you see that? The different versions. Uh, not yet. Different here we go. So, yeah, so these are some of the ideas we had initially. So you can see none of these, none of these are the saffle, but but there is one on, on the top with long ears. Mm -hmm. And then the one on the top right has got quite the same sort of feel, the same sort of body shape and legs. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there were all sorts down the bottom right, sort of one that was a bit like a sloth with like long arms. And the one on the top left is a bit more like an alien like we talked about sort of, mm -hmm. That might have come come from down from the world, somewhere. and the one on the middle right, um, at the far end, has got a little a snout that I think was the beginning of the idea for the trunk. For the trunk, exactly. Yes, mm -hmm. There's a few of them with, with snouts. So you can see that looks... uh, I when I'm when I'm creating a book, I, I go through hundreds of pages of of paper, just creating different sort of sketches. And uh, That's right. yeah, it's, it's a huge amount of work. And uh, when you look at the, the finished book, it looks like it's all just appeared all at once. But in fact, there's a, there's a huge amount of work that goes into um, into goes the development. Into yeah. Are we ready for another question? Yeah. Yes. On, Nicola? Oh. So how did you create the world that the snaffle lives in? Oh, uh, well, that's that's probably more one for Tom. I think it was interesting just to say initially is that um, we both knew it was going to be a city, um, but what we had to decide was what kind of city, what the city would look like, um, and what kind of characters would populate that city. And that was something that we had to discuss with our publishers as well, because they had quite strong opinions as well about what it should look like. So when you're working on a book, I just want to say that it's a very much a team effort. It's not just the author, it's not just the illustrator. Um, in this case, we're very lucky in that obviously we live together so we can we can bounce ideas off each other and talk about things all the time. But the publishers also have a say and they also have, uh, we're very lucky to work with Alison and Zoe, Alison the editor and Zoe the art director. Um, they're incredibly good, incredibly supportive. They have brilliant ideas as well. So it was a team effort really, wasn't it, Tom? Yes, very much. And uh, to begin with, because uh, both Helen and I have, have lived in big cities. I've, I've mm. lived in, in London and I lived abroad as well in Madrid. And Helen's lived in Mexico. I lived in Mexico years, City uh, for a few years. And we both and lived in Bristol for, for a while, another yeah. big city. So uh, I love the idea of setting the, the especially after, if you know the, the book, the Snatcher book, uh, that's set in, in a forest, in a very sort of typical sort of almost sort of fairy tale like uh, yeah. Uh, forest setting it was really nice to, to do this book in, in a city in a big urban area and mm. uh, i love drawing all the all the different uh, spaces in the city th things like the level crossings and the traffic lights and uh, all the different buildings i'm going to share my screen again because um the first time the first city that i i created can you see that now So that's a, quite a space age looking city. So it's a futuristic, like futuristic. city. And um, you can see the sort of cars are like sort of bubble cars. And there's even a flying car in, in the sky. And uh, yeah, the, the publishers, you know, really like this idea, but I think they wanted it to be relevant to today. So mm -hmm. they wanted it to be set in a sort of more contemporary city. So in the end, um, we went for a city uh, like the one you can see here and uh, like I said I, I love drawing all the different details you can see if you look at the the street signs we've got um, donuts for sale and there's like a donut shop and there's rooms to rent and it must be a hotel and there must be a theatre down the street because it's playing Hamlet or a Shakespeare play <laughs> and uh, we've got the bus which is says central it's obviously going into the centre of town so I had loads of fun creating the city I also did lots of different sort of yeah, it took a long time to decide how to sort of uh, put everything together. These are four pictures you can see of, of um, how I imagined the the very first page of the book. So in the top left, you can see the snaffle arriving at a train station yeah. because maybe she arrived on the train and got off at the station. 
and you can see everyone pulling their cases along. And then the top right, you can see uh, coming out of a subway, like coming out of the, the underground, and again, encountering this, this huge, great city. I don't know if any of you have had that, that feeling of arriving, mm -hmm. getting on a train and arriving somewhere new and large. You step off the train or come out of the underground, it's like, it's wow. It's overwhelming, isn't it? Yeah. But then we really, we're talking about it. We wanted, because there's lots of different locations in the story, like the cinema and uh, the, library. Uh, the park and the library in particular. So we wanted maybe to tr include some of those in the first picture so that children, when they're reading the book or with their parents or looking through it themselves, they can spot some of the places at the beginning that come later in the book. So we, I also wanted to have Max somehow at the beginning of the story. So there were, because you don't meet him until much later in the book. I wanted him to be there at the very start so that when and you I go back, you could find him. It's so quite we went fun to this. As well that he's so near the snaffle, but they don't actually see each other. Exactly. They don't meet each other at the beginning. So I had this idea of the snaffle arriving somehow on, on the rooftops and having this view of the, this panoramic view of the whole city. And she can see the cinema, the library, across the park. You've got the train as well, and you know, people in the hotel. So there's loads going on. So that, that was that was really good fun to to work out how to piece the city together. I even drew myself a very quick little sketch map of um so when I was drawing the pictures I could work out where everything would be. And uh, yeah. you can see there's the alley at the bottom and the street where she uh even so that you can check it out so that the bandstand is always in the correct place or the you know the skate ramp mm. um at the end. It all sort of makes makes sense. There's a lot of planning went in, into the book, and it yeah. Here's just a little uh, example of all the, some of the details. So we've got uh, like Fox's grocery store on the left and a cactus shop. And the cactus shop is actually, we were walking through a city a couple of years ago and we mm. passed the cactus shop just like this one. And I remember seeing it and thinking, wow, that's great. I'd love to put that into a, into a picture or a book somewhere. Um, in the bottom left, we've got a bicycle shop. It's even got like a unicycle and a scooter hanging up. And then we must have a sort of art gallery. And I don't know, can anyone spot the famous the famous painting hanging up in the um, in the window it's uh, I think it's Van Gogh's sunflowers so there's loads of fun putting in all, all the details in this sort of old-fashioned television uh, shop with some really old televisions at the bottom yeah some I don't from, know what they're doing there <laughs> from what, Relics, I guess, the yeah they're like from from when <laughs> Ellen and I were, were young the televisions yeah. used to look a bit like that I remember our first TV <laughs> looks so that was quite yeah. fun putting in some of those details and here are a few um details that weren't included in the story because yeah, it's just not outtakes. enough so we've got a, the, the i imagine the snaffle sort of in people's homes and i was thinking like what sort of homes would all these different animals live in so the crocodiles are all in a bath the cats <laughs> are all on sort of like comfy sort of cat beds uh and then uh, and the hippos are all sort of slouched on the sofa with a massive great television being being guzzled up <laughs> And we've got a cat and a bear on a, uh, they must be at the gym. At one point there was going to be a gym on the on the main square as well. That, that uh, got taken out at some point. So there we are. That, that's how we, we created the, the, the city. Um, mm. It was so much fun, wasn't it? It was so much fun mm. coming up with all the pictures and, and discussing it. I think that's one of the biggest pleasures of creating a picture book, particularly when we work together, is that you are creating a world, really. It's like I, I like to think it, it's a bit like, being a film director mm. and you get to but you get to do everything you, you get to sort of cast all the characters you, you're also <laughs> in charge of the wardrobe uh you're in charge of the locations you do everything set design everything completely everything lighting <laughs> should we try another question have we got time yeah. for one more oh oh now then did you have a library close by when you were growing up yeah we did well i, I certainly did I, I grew up in a little town called weymouth which is on the south coast of England in Dorset. And yeah, I lived uh, not quite within walking distance. Um, in fact, when I was very little, I remember we had a mobile library. Right. Yes. Yeah, so we had a van that came round and it parked in a nearby street. And so I used to go every week, get on. I, I remember still the excitement of getting on the library, the library van um, and swapping my books. That was, that was really good fun going onto the bus. It was like a little bus. And you'd go on and there'd be books everywhere and you'd choose your next books that you wanted to read and then swap them and, and take them home. And then when I was a little bit older, my mum used to take me to the Central Library in Weymouth, which was a great library. Um, and I used to go there for years every week and, and swap my books. And 
because we didn't have enough money to buy a lot of books. Uh, I did, you know, I did have some books at home. I was lucky to have some books at home, but um, I, I read so much because I loved reading. And I don't think my parents could have kept up with my reading habits. So I used to go to the library and that's where I found all my, my books and swap them every week, get a new pile, take them home, read them, bring them back. The, the library, our local library, I grew up in Salisbury. The local library was really important to me because uh, mm. I'm dyslexic and I found reading a real struggle when I was at school. And, and I really hated the, the reading books we got given, and you know, because I was made to read the reading books at school. <laughs> But my mum and dad, that you know, they used to take us to the library every weekend because my older brothers, like Helen, were really big readers and mm. they just got through so many books. But um, in the library, you know, I didn't want to read the books, but I found comic books. And these were my favourite comic books, the Asterix books. And I loved the comic books because, firstly, the books in the library, I could choose them myself. You know, no one made me read them. I, I chose them myself. And I used to just read the pictures and make up my own mm. stories without reading the words. And eventually, you know, someone helped me. I think it must be my mum my read my first Asterix book and I, I loved it. It was really, really, you know, the words were actually really funny, good jokes. So I, I then got all the other Asterix books out that I could in the library. There were, there were loads of them. And, uh, and that's how I got started reading. So if it wasn't for discovering picture books and comics at the library, mm. I wouldn't have gone on to read all the other brilliant books that I've read since then. And I, I can read yeah. anything and everything now. And we still uh, start the comic books and the graphic oh, novels. That's great. And they're you know, really popular. We also so have a lot of books without words. Yeah. These days, these days, there are so many more comic books and graphic novels that they're like fantastic for mm. all ages, right up to adults. So, yeah. you know, anybody, it's never too late to, to get into reading through through reading mm. pictures. Basically, I think it's such an important way to start reading. And if it wasn't for the library, that, yeah. um, that might never have happened for me. I, I, mean, we... I was just going to say, presumably, the comic books also inspired you to become an illustrator. Maybe definitely, I, I think it. You know. It, you know, I've always loved putting words and pictures together to tell a story. And I think that must come from, you know, enjoying, you know, being able to enjoy stories with pictures, even when I couldn't read them very well. So definitely, I think it goes right back to that. Sorry, Helen. No, I was just going to say that um, when our daughters were little, we took them to the library as well. We were very lucky. We were living in Bristol at the time and we had a fantastic library just up the road, five minutes up the road. So I used to take them there at least twice a week, I think. And uh, one of those times they did a rhyme time that was fantastic. And then when we moved here to Swansea, we found another brilliant library down the road. So we used to take them there uh, to, to swap their books and, and to go to the library rhyme time as well. So, and they're also great places to meet people libraries. In fact, I met several other mums with kids my age, taking them to the library. And we got, you know, we got chatting there. I think they're, they're wonderful hubs for the community, aren't they? They really bring absolutely, people absolutely. together. Yes, mm, yes. So that yeah, libraries for us are central, they always have been. And uh, yeah, we love them. And we, we were very pleased. Very... We were both very pleased to be able to put a library into the yeah. school brief. And uh, oh, yes, yeah, yes. It's really <laughs> nice that that, yeah, that, really could, that could be a part really of the good. city. Yeah. Now, I know when we were talking before, Helen, you mentioned that you might have time to read the Snatcher yes. book. Yeah. We do, yes. We've got, yeah. we've got plenty of time. So we've got um, the Snatcher book is, um, as I think you mentioned earlier, Alma, it's coming out again with a new, brand new cover. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the new version in the house yet. Uh, this is the the old version with the, the old cover, but I think we've got the new cover on the screen, haven't we, Tom? Yes, yeah, so I'll just share that screen now and you can uh, we can look at the slides as well. Mm -hmm. So we're really, really excited that the Snatcher book's coming out again. Um, there it is. That's the, the lovely new cover image of the Snatcher book and um and I, I'm going to share the story with you now I'm not going to say any more about the story I'm just I'm just going to read it one dark dark night in Burrow Down a rabbit called Eliza Brown found a book and settled down when a Snatcher book flew into town in every house in every bed a bedtime book was being read. Tales of dragons spitting flames, witches playing spooky games, pirates on the seven seas, princesses trying to sleep on peas. And every child in every bed listened hard to each word said. Eliza Brown at number three was reading quite contentedly, 
Her curtains opened, just a chink. She barely had a chance to blink. Her storybook just disappeared. Eliza found that very weird. The little owls on Mummy's lap were quite surprised to hear a tap against their bedroom window pane. Tap, tap, they heard the noise again. Before they'd even looked around, their book was gone without a sound. The wind blew wild across the sky. The smaller squirrel heard a cry. What's that? She whispered to her dad. But then, and this was really bad, before they'd had a chance to look, she lost her very favourite book. And so it went, night after night. Books disappeared from left and right. Five books here and six books there. The shelves began to look quite bare. In Burrowdown, the rumours spread of book thieves under every bed. Eliza Brown at number three was keen to solve the mystery. She planned one night to lie in wait and use a pile of books as bait. Long hours passed without a peep. She'd nearly fallen fast asleep when suddenly Eliza heard a flap of wings. A bat? A bird? Eliza saw a shadow loom enormous right across her room. What kind of monster could it be? Eliza thought, you don't scare me. And yet her heart was beating fast. She'd have to face the thief at last. She threw the window open wide and shouted to the thing outside, stop stealing all our books right now. Just give them back. I don't care how. I'm sorry, came a little voice. I really am. I had no choice. Eliza looked down in surprise. She couldn't quite believe her eyes. So who are you and what's your name? The creature hung its head in shame. He mumbled with a mournful look. I'm just a little snatcher book. Eliza nodded solemnly. She sat the creature on her knee. You can't just come and help yourself to every book on every shelf. A tear rolled from the creature's eye and softly he began to cry. I know it's wrong, but can't you see? I've got no one to read to me. Eliza sighed. He looked so sad. If he just had a mum or dad to read him stories every night, well, then he might behave all right. That very night, they hatched a plan. And so the Snatcher Book began to give back all the books he'd nicked. Eliza Brown was very strict. And trying hard to prove himself, he stacked them neatly on each shelf. And when he made his full amends, Eliza called on all her friends and told them how he'd worked all night to turn a wrong into a right. And now, each night in Burrow Down, as darkness falls upon the town, in every house, in every bed, a bedtime book is being read. And if you take a closer look, you might just see the Snatcher Book perched happily on someone's bed, listening hard to each word said. And that was the story of the Snatcher Book. I hope you enjoyed that, everybody. That is absolutely beautiful. It is a perfect oh, bedtime story, isn't thank it? Thank you. Absolutely yeah. perfect. Yes, beautiful. yes. We've even yes. got a little Snatcher Book here. Oh! And the Snatcher Book comes with me when I go into schools and do author visits. Um, so and, and all the kids love to meet the Snatcher book. So the Snatcher book. yeah, lots of fun. And I had story. just as much fun designing the whole world that uh, yeah. Eliza Brown lives in, and Absolutely. the Snatcher book, you know, arrives in as uh, as the, as the staff. I, I think you can see this. You know, there's quite big parallels. You know, between the two, mm. it's both about a creature coming into a new environment and uh, well, causing a bit of mayhem, and, uh, <laughs> and then and, and eventually being accepted as well and yeah. uh, well welcomed in so yeah and in both that's cases, quite a strong theme mm, yeah and in both cases they're both just looking for somebody um to, to give them some attention really the snatcher book wants somebody to read him a story 
and the snaffle just wants somebody to play with her so yes. yeah it's almost like two sides of a of the same coin really but very very different settings as you say yeah yeah well the screen yeah. thief is already in our libraries if anyone wants to borrow Fantastic. copies and as soon Yay. as the um the snatcher books republished we'll be buying copies of that as well Brilliant. do you have any plans for another book yeah well we're wow. working on one right now aren't we we are or, it's called, or tom uh, is illustrating it it's called Orange Moon Blue Baboon, and it's a very it's a, it's still a rhyming picture book, but it's mm -hmm. it's it's much shorter than um, yeah than the, the the Screen Thief, or so it's, it is quite different. It's possibly for slightly younger children, so mm. that's really exciting. Yeah, so it's written in mono rhyme, which means that all the words um, have the same rhyme, as in Orange Moon Blue Baboon. So yeah. Um, don't want to give too much away, no. but Tom has been doing some fantastic work on the illustrations. Um, maybe you can just share one uh, uh, sketch of a sneak peek. <laughs> yeah, let me see if I can find one of the one of the one of the final pictures. I just need to just give me a minute to find it yeah. in my computer. Mm. And then, obviously, we're always working on. I'm always working on new ideas as yeah. well. Um, right. Let me see if Here I can share go. the screen. It's coming. <laughs> so this is, can you see that? Here we yes. go. So this is a scene where you can see the blue baboon getting very wet. Yes. <laughs> so that's just one I of the pages. It. I think you're the first people to see this yeah. artwork. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> anywhere. Well, it's I, an honor, yeah. I've got I've got a deadline this week to finish all the pictures by uh, by it by the end of this week or early next mm. week. So I, I'm very busy trying to finish it all off. Absolutely. Well, it's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it's exciting to have another one on the way. I was going to say also that uh, if uh, if you'd like to know if you'd like to learn how to draw um, the the stature book again on um, on my website on the activities page under the the stature book there is a tutorial as well of how to draw mm. the stature book so there's loads and loads of things that you can discover on our websites yeah absolutely and there's there's loads of resources on on both of our websites uh, to do with the stature book you can even make a stature book puppet uh this is designed by somebody in the states actually they created a little workshop of how to make your own stature book puppet um i think using cardboard um using yeah, some card that you paint and, and put together and lots and lots of other activities as well. So they're all for free and you can download them from our websites. And if you've missed either of those websites, you can watch again on Catch Up and uh, make sure that you get details of Helen and Tom's websites. So I think for today, that's about it, isn't it? I think we're getting close to time. Um, and I'd like to say a huge thank you to Helen and to Tom because it's been absolutely amazing. Oh, I've absolutely really loved meeting Max and the Snaffle and also the Snatcher Book and Eliza. It's been absolutely fantastic and a lot of fun. And I hope you've all drawn some beautiful Snaffles for us. Oh, yeah, we'd uh, love to see them. Yes, yeah. and yes. I hope you're feeling inspired to go away and create some of your own characters mm. and maybe create some of your own stories with your own pictures. Absolutely. I yeah, that's that's good. how we started. You that's know, how it all starts, isn't it? Yeah, 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 making our own. This is uh, the very first book I ever made when I was about six. Oh. Um, a surprise treat, it was called, and I did all my own Helen used to be an illustrator. <laughs> <laughs> you can see them there. It's so, just um, the, done on... An ordinary bit of pa bits yeah. of paper stapled, stapled together, isn't it? Folded up. Well, even stapled. sellotape together. Oh, you sellotape. Can see. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can see. So um, that's how I got started. And I, I, you know, anybody out there who loves um, making their own stories and, and drawing their own pictures, just just try making a little simple book like this. And, um, and I, you know, maybe my mum and dad, my mum and dad came came around the other day, and they brought in uh, Thomas Doherty topic book from when I was about <laughs> six years old. And uh, I don't know, some of the pictures, this is my favourite page because it says, you can do better than this in big writing. And it's not the best <laughs> picture in the world in the world either. I just want to show you, you know, I wasn't always amazing at drawing. I just... Uh, and you were I only was, six. No, I loved yeah, it. I was I kids, but I just loved it. But I was no better. Than, I don't think I was any better than any other six-year-old. We often go to schools. Some of the, some of the children yeah. are so talented. Yeah. They're amazing pictures. But uh, 
if you you know if you find something you love like drawing or heaven like loved writing you've just got to keep on doing it and keep on enjoying it really mm. and keep practicing keep practicing thank you so much both of you oh, before i go I'm just going to give a quick mention for next week's Library Adventures Live where my colleague Dinah will be joined by author Laura Mooka and illustrator Hannah Peck to share with you their book Rita's Rabbit and it's a charming and engaging picture book about a girl, an unwanted pet and a rabbit that apparently is a bit rude so I can't <laughs> wait to meet this rude rabbit next week <laughs> anyway, th thank you fun. all it does, doesn't it? Thank you all, and particular thanks to Helen and Tom for watching our Library Adventures Live today. Enjoy your holidays from school, and we hope to see you next time. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Thank Bye you. Now. Bye. 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 Bye.